Right. Well, um, earlier this morning, um, some of you will have watched part six of the uh, Dalek Invasion of Earth, which was the last episode in which the Doctor's first companion, Susan, appeared. So, um, having seen that... Grand... What did I say? Oh, granddaughter. I'm sorry. Granddaughter Susan appeared. So, what better introduction, including catcalls from the back, <laughs> can I give to a lovely lady who hasn't aged in 25 years of Doctor Who, Miss Carol Ann Ford. dare you companion she just I have to I see so 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 right well there's a there's a good point to start Carol um there's been a lot of um discussion among Doctor Who fans about whether Susan really was the Doctor's granddaughter well I don't see why the people of nowadays can you hear me I can't hear myself no I can hear uh, yeah, are these working folks can you hear um, us I don't see why suddenly this should be a bone of contention I mean for God's sake you know when I did the thing in the beginning I was his granddaughter so why should things have changed Who's Mrs. Who? I don't know. Hmm. It's, uh, uh, Just because really there's not a mention of her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, no, I mean, I agree with you. I prefer to think of her as, as the granddaughter, but, but a lot of people have thought that it's just um, it was a term I mean, of endearment. I don't so. understand why all the sort of deep psychological probings go on these days. Mm. You know, I mean, why? I, I, can't you just leave it as it was? Why change it? <laughs> mm. Well, Carol, when, 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 when you first... Um, came along to Doctor Who. You were given this script for the first story. What did you actually think? I mean, before 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 um, before you started shooting it, did you think, well, this looks like a job. I'll get paid. Or did you think, wow, this is going to be the the greatest thing ever? What did no, you think? none of us thought it was going to be the greatest thing ever. We thought it was quite an amusing job to do at the time. Is this going on and off? I can. Can you hear Quick, it? All right? Someone at the back, um, Rob. I can see you there. Put your hand up if you can hear us well. Yeah. Yes. Only a bit. Can we can we have some volume, chaps? Can you turn up? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now things are happening. <laughs> right. Um, no, we all thought it was a very exciting job, but it was just a job. I mean, mm. we didn't think it was going to be something that would go down in yeah. sort of history. <laughs> was, was 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 there any stage then, while you were still on the program, that you began to realise that this really was going to be big? Or, or yes, after yeah. the first one went out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They repeated the first episode, didn't they? Uh, <coughs> Yeah. Yes, they did for various reasons. One, mm. one being, of course, that uh, unfortunately we went out the same day as the death of President Kennedy. Yeah. That was another historic occasion that unfortunately we were linked with. But yes, um, yes I mean, we thought that perhaps, perhaps we should go out again. And also because there was a huge demand, you know, everybody yeah. was sort of saying, what was that? And we missed it and we want to see it, mm. you know. <clears throat> so they pushed it out again. Yes. Well, um, oddly enough, we're 25 years on in Doctor Who now. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, Carol. The, the, um, it's rumoured fairly strongly that the first story of, of the next series, which will be the 25th series, is going to be set in Coal Hill School. Um, is it? Where, where it all started off. But in what time? Um, in, in 1963. Oh? Um, yes. Now, the Daleks are involved, and, um, and I mean, we don't know the precise details, but we've got something some, something to do with, with the Daleks trying to prevent the Doctor from leaving Earth in the first place. Do you think that's a, that's a good idea, to, to bring back old continuity references in that and build a whole story around it? Or um... I don't see how they're going to do it. I mean, what they're using... I mean, if, if it's exactly the right... Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. If it's exactly the same time, but to the day, I, how can they do that without having the original characters? But if it's the same time, but within a, a few months of them having departed or mm. something. I don't know. I don't know. I, it all gets so complicated. Yes. <laughs> I really don't know. It would be fascinating for me to see. Yes. Well, I mean, it's a very interesting idea. Mm. Yes. Well, we'll have to see how that goes. But is it, is it just a strong rumour, or is it actually... Well, um, um, well, I don't know. Have you heard any better rumours <laughs> than I know? have? Anybody know? Yes. Well, I, well we, we, I mean, we definitely know that, that uh, Michael Sheard has been cast as the headmaster of Coal Hill School, so, so we know that much. Mm. So the school is involved, yes, yes. But obviously, I mean, um, it's not going to have Bill Russell and Jacqueline Pierce in it. Um, Jacqueline so who? Jacqueline. <laughs> Jacqueline Hill. I'm sorry. 
that was a bit of a slip, wasn't it? I'm very sorry about it. Well, it probably won't have Jacqueline Pierce in it either. <laughs> um, yes, um, so, so, so that's, uh, that's quite interesting. Oh, you've thrown me completely now. Um, right. Um, more recently, um, you uh, you appeared in the Five Doctors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, um, how, how how did that come about? Were you, were you approached early they on in the proceedings? <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. yes, they asked me to do it. What did you What did you think? Um, first reaction to the idea of someone else playing uh, the First Doctor. Uh, I didn't see how they could ever do it convincingly, but as it turned out, I thought he was superb. Mm. Did any of you see it? Yes, you've all seen it. Don't you think he was marvellous? I mean, he really. I mean, sadly, he's died as yes, well. Yes, that's now. right. Yeah. yeah. But it was it was really quite uncanny for me because I'd seen him as an actor in various other things, and I had met him, of course, you know, before we actually started rehearsing. And of course, during rehearsals, we were very close. But I hadn't seen him in the full gear, you know. I mean, the the full Doctor Who mm. paraphernalia. And the first time I saw him in that was when we were in Wales on location. And he had his back to me. And I had to sort of go up to him just as a test shot and say something. And he had to turn around and say, Susan. And it really sent chills up and down my spine because he looked, I know he's taller, but he did look exactly like Bill. And he sounded just like Bill. It was quite uncanny. I thought he did it very well, without actually trying to impersonate <coughs> William Hartnell. Yeah. You know. Well, it would have been dangerous. He just got the essence of the part mm. so beautifully. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And luckily for me, he's, he's also a very tactile actor. You know, uh, some actors like this, this sort of work, you know, when you're acting, all this sort of business going on, touch, touch, touch. And some actors can't stand it. You know, they really can't stand it. And you definitely know on the first day of rehearsal whether you've got this sort of an actor or that sort of an actor, you know. And Bill Hartnell and I were constantly, if you watch these things, we're always cuddling each other mm. and, and doing things to each other, you know, picking away at him. And he's always sort of doing this sort of thing to me, you know. And it would have been horrendous for me to have had to work with an actor playing my grandfather that I couldn't do this sort of business to, mm. the cuddling up and all the rest of it, because I was used to it. But he, luckily enough, was a tactile actor too. Yeah. It was marvellous. Super. Well, another chap um, who appeared in The Five Doctors, um, fleetingly in the same scene as you, um, is a chap who's standing at the back of the hall there. I'd like to bring him in at this juncture. It's Mr. Nicholas Courtney. No doubt about me, I'm a tactile actor. Oh. Shall <laughs> I sit here or there or where? Oh, anywhere you like, Nick. Sorry, I'm just messing anywhere around I... with my remote control here. Do you want some here? Uh, no, I've got a wine coming. It's all right. Oh. Um, I've got a wine does coming. It, it, is this one Good working? Or it is? <clears throat> it is. OK at the back? Because John Purvey told me I never understood technology. He's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I play the Brigadier doesn't understand these things. Can I say one thing first of all? How good it is to be back in Liverpool again. I was here about 18 months ago in Halloween time and I didn't have a chance to say something about Liverpool which I feel very strongly. My first introduction to Liverpool was in 1969 uh, and I was playing at the Liverpool Playhouse which I trust is still around. Is the Liverpool Playhouse theatre still good? You never know what they're going to tear down next. And um, I was doing a play called The Prime of Gene Brodie, directed by Ian McKellen, who you must have heard of. And then it was followed. They asked me to stay on do a Victorian musical, and I lost a stone doing that, because um, in this Victorian musical, I had to do Leonard Sachs, you know, uh, 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 I had to do the chairman, and then rush backstage and do William Corder in uh, Mariah Martin or Murder in the Red Barn. You know, and that's a lot of um, extremely strong acting going on. And right at the end of, uh, of this Victorian musical, we did a number in which I was forced to join in and sing. And I'm not a very good singer. And it was God Bless the Prince of Wales. Now, I don't care who knows it, that I'm an ardent royalist. For example, if the Brigadier had been fighting in the Civil War in England, he would have been on the side of the Cavaliers, I think. But um, I also do uh, think a great deal 
of the Prince of Wales because um, he tells certain people like, what's his name, Death's Head Tebbit? Is that his name? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, you know, uh, but, well, of course, the royalty can't reply, but um, I was appalled uh, at Norman Tebbit's attack on the Prince of Wales. I'm a monarchist, as long as you know. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> anyway, that's enough of uh, my... But um, I did enjoy my time in Liverpool so much. I learned a great deal. Ian McKellen was the best director that I've ever been directed by in the theatre. Uh, and the prime of Gene Brodie was a great success with people like Barbara Ewing, Liz Gebhardt, and a lot of other people. And I played the one-armed, I don't know if people know the book, or it was dramatized, and he has one arm, this uh, Teddy Lloyd. And so they had to make a special pair of trousers for me. Uh, because unlike Robert Stevens, who played the part in the film, he played it with two arms. And the whole point is you should play it with one arm. And um, I have to tell you that my hand was geographically south, southwest of my crutch. <laughs> because that's where it had to be. Anyway, enough of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Nick. Uh, Special pair of trousers, you see. Right. Now, uh, like Carol, Nick, um, we don't always remember this, but you did, in fact, work with uh, William Hartnell um, yes. for a number of episodes of Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. um, how, did you, how did you find him? Well, it was the Dalek master plan, wasn't it? And I was playing that Brett Byron, who got killed off by his sister, fratricide. Uh, it, it was... Towards the end, I think, of Bill Hartnell's mm. time, I remember. And um, he, for some reason, he liked me, and he put me with his agent. Now, that wasn't his fault, the fact that I didn't work for a year after that. <laughs> uh, but he was convinced that um, uh, that was the agent I should be with. But that doesn't matter. I got on very well with Bill. He was very kind to me. And um, I, think, I think someone asked me recently what he would think about this, as you can see, 25 years. I think he Ooh, would have I been... Got yeah. Oh, this, this don't is, worry, don't worry, we can arrange that. This we is the latest, that. by the way. I, 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 I got oh, that. Sorry. Well done. <laughs> Nick, Nick is modelling the very latest in BBC Enterprises um, T-shirts, while, while I'm spilling drinks all over <laughs> Carol. Uh, yeah, so this is the one to rush out and buy. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I like Bill because but it's very nice. He liked me, you see, and that always helps. But all this is to do with Douglas Canfield. I mean, he, he engaged me for that. Then he brought me back, as you know, in the Web of Fear Brigadier. And can I tell a quick story about oh, yes. the Web of Fear? Oh, sure. With the one with Pat Trudden. I was originally booked to play uh, part Captain Knight, who, like Brett Byron, was going to be killed off. The last moment, Douglas Campbell rang me up and said, Nick, do you mind playing the Colonel, Lethbridge Stewart, instead of the Captain Knight? I said, not at all. Promotion's wonderful. The money's the same. It would be with the BBC. <laughs> But, um, of course, and I owe all that to an actor by the name of David Langton, because he was booked to play Colonel Lethbridge-Stewart, got a better job or something. So the rest is history. Super. Well, um, Nick, we, we, uh, Carol and I, well, I was anyway, and Carol was, was being mystified, <laughs> talking about, about the new story, Remembrance of the Daleks, just a, just a few moments ago. I gather that you might have a little snippet of... of inside information on that story? Well, yes, I was out on location uh, with... Um, uh, well, John Nathan Turner asked me to come out. They were filming in Hammersmith, and, you know, just for the day. And uh, so Sylvester and Sophie Aldred were about to make an entrance. They said, come on, Nick, come on, come and join. I said, no, I can't do that. I don't know the director. <laughs> I mean, you're about to... I mean, it's filming. Come on, the schedule is hard, hard work, work, work. And I didn't dare. And then later, um, uh, when they had a break, uh, the newspaper around, and uh, Sylvester said, this is the military advisor. Uh, you know, there was I, you know, looking sort of, you know, civvies, nothing, uh, no, no um, costume or anything like that, because of the Brigadier's costume I probably couldn't get into now. And, uh, but what they've done, which is very nice, is they've put a line, it, it's set on Earth, I think, and Daleks are certainly involved, I know, because I saw my friend John Scott Martin, who's done more Dalek work than most. And, um, there's a group captain, you see, it's a military, uh, it's the Air Force. And apparently, Sylvester does come in at one point, strides into this group captain's office and says, now look here, Brigadier, oh, oh group captain. So that's rather sweet, they put in a line about me. <laughs> well, well, well. <clears throat> um, Carol. I trust. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. Uh, Carol, um, the Daleks are still going, 25 years on. Um, again, looking back. 
to the way you saw things in, in the early days. Did you, did you think the Daleks were going to be the most famous monster ever in science fiction? No, we didn't. When we first saw them, we killed ourselves laughing. <laughs> <laughs> we called them pepper pots. I mean, they do look a bit like pepper pots, don't they? And of course, the thing is, they can't, you know, it's, it's extraordinary, really. We were only saying this earlier on. I think it was us talking about it, wasn't it? You know, a bit how silly they are, really, as enemies, because they can't really go very fast. Let's face it, I mean, they've got to have, they've got so many restrictions. I mean, in our day, they had to have some kind of electric contact mm. with a metallic floor, supposedly, to enable them to go. Well, I mean, you've only got to sort of topple them over and they lose their contact and that's it. <laughs> or, in fact, insert something in between them and their metallic floor so they lose the connection. But somehow or other, the audiences didn't mind. I mean, they, they looked threatening because that wonderful voice, you know, that wonderful, marvellous voice that at that time one heard nothing like it before. You know, I mean, now there are lots of imitation dialect type voices which yeah. they use for all sorts of things. But, uh, I mean, they, they, did, they were very photogenic, let's face it. They're very, very photogenic things. And, uh, was Roy Skelton the original voice? Peter no, it was Hawkins. Peter, Peter Hawkins. Ah, I saw Peter Hawkins on Tuesday, by the way. Oh, how yes, is he? Very well. Oh, good. Oh, well, marvellous. I saw him at an equity meeting, actually, oh, but we'll you? talk about that. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, I should... Um, <clears throat> the reason that Nick <laughs> said this is, is, is because uh, he and I were sitting down just now and saying, <clears throat> how are we going to get equity into this? So, Nick has managed to do it, so... Um, well, no, that's outrageous. Nick, tell me about equity. <laughs> well... <laughs> Um, you, you should, can I do this? Why not? Well, he's, mean, he's the chairman, not uh, me. Ask oh, him. Right. <laughs> well, um, in 1968, when the Brigadier first appeared, for the first time I stood for election to the Council of Equity, which is very close to my heart, and they uh, keep on electing me every year. My elections are just coming up again for the uh, 20th year, so um, I hope I get elected again. So what did you want to know about equity, Nick? Um, well, I, mean, I, I, I was going to ask you about your involvement in it, but I think you've encapsulated it in, in 20 seconds. <laughs> oh my God, you mean I've cut Q for once correctly? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's well worthwhile, and um, we've got a battle on our hands. Uh, I was mm. in America a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there's a writer's strike on in Hollywood, and Terry Nation, who you must know his name, and he and I were there in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago. and. Um, they are fighting the sort of battle that we are going to face in a moment, which is the whole principle of residuals and repeats. Um, now, if I, uh, I wouldn't dare stand for election again. I mean, we've got to fight this battle, because apparently the new thinking is that uh, all the independent television companies can tear up the contracts that they've agreed, the management's agreed, freely negotiated with equity, because of a certain philosophy in Downing Street. I'll try not to mention Downing Street at the moment. Oh, go on, do. <laughs> oh, I better not. <laughs> uh, because otherwise I should get frightfully upset. <clears throat> um, and this is uh, something which, I mean, for what it's worth, I mean, I've been out of work the last five months. If I didn't have my repeat checks from Doctor Who, I should have great difficulty in paying my bills, supporting my two children, etc. And after all, I, I don't understand that. A writer. Uh, this, this copyright with a writer, well, with the advance of technology where performances can be beamed all around the world and with the uh, satellite dis, uh, discs or whatever they are or cable and all that, and you can go on, on repeating people's work, well, then they're entitled to a share of the cake, are they not? Absolutely. If they've created the part, oh. and so is the writer, mm. and so is the actor, particularly when actors are casually employed people, which we are. Mm. Is there, is there not also a controversy about um, about video releases? Like, for example, you've you've I think you're in in a couple of uh, Doctor Who videos that have now come out. Yeah. Um, uh, about being paid for those. I've been paid for those. You've been paid for those. Oh yes. Oh, jolly yes. good. Yes. The BBC are very honourable. It's um, Equity's having more trouble with the ITV companies at the moment, but it's uh, I'm still battling there. Mm. I was at a negotiating meeting the other day. Uh, I mean, this whole thing of farming out 25% of ITV stuff, 25% of uh, BBC stuff to the independent companies. That's fine. But the independent companies are now trying to uh, pay you a salary and abolish the whole idea of residuals and repeats. Uh, they're offering you buyouts. Now, buyouts are very tempting sometimes for an actor. They'll offer you a great deal of money, but it's actually in the actor's or performer's interest probably to keep the principle of, I mean, overseas sales and repeats residuals are more important, and we at Equity encourage people to uh, not take a buyout because sometimes they lose. I mean, it's a gamble, but most actors don't mind taking that gamble. 
I mean, I did something called Jenny's War not long ago, and um, uh, uh, that I thought would never be seen again. It was. Um, anyone see Jenny's War? Oh, yes, it was super. It wasn't. It was dreadful. I liked it. <laughs> I liked it. You liked it. Yes. Well, well, you like. If it's the one I'm thinking of, I liked it. <laughs> was that with Diane Cannon? No, no, no. Ah, I something else. Ah, ah, what it was, I liked something else. No, I played another army officer than that. I had to discover that Diane Cannon was a woman and not a man. It was an extraordinary oh. story. <laughs> no, I didn't see that. <laughs> no, it was extraordinary. It was I was something playing, altogether different. I was playing um, an army officer who was a major. It was a World War II story, and um, it was about this woman who dressed up as a sergeant to find her uh, son who was um, in a constant, uh, in a prisoner of war camp. And I was playing this army officer who was a major. That's demotion for a start. <laughs> but um, who turns out, curiously enough, to be the character I was playing was a doctor. I mean, he was a medical man, and he had to discover that Diane Cannon uh, was um, a woman, and not a man. But uh, I'd better not digress about that, because it wasn't very good, but they paid me an awful lot of money. CBS were rather generous, American finance. So I don't complain about that. And there were some lovely people like Nig Nigel Hawthorne and uh, Christopher Kazanoff and um, Sean Tudor Owen and lots of other people. We all enjoyed ourselves. <coughs> Diane Cannon was extraordinary. Um, <coughs> she is an American actress. Uh, apart from being the fifth wife, of, fifth wife of Cary Grant, she was extraordinary. She was being paid about, I hope the National Enquirer or the press aren't here, she was being paid about a quarter of a million pounds or dollars, it doesn't matter, that's enough, and refused to come out of her caravan because it was raining. <laughs> she wasn't very popular, and not even with the American director, but maybe that's enough about that. Well, having established that... Miss Courtney is very rich and knows lots of famous people. Um, I think we'll throw the questions open to the audience. Has anyone got a question for Carol or Nick? Yes, over there. Uh, have we got a microphone going round? Yes. Run, run, run. Where's the white wine I ordered? Oh, it's on the way. It's on the way. I'll have some of that in this. Oh. Carol? Yes? If there was um, a seven faces of Doctor Who, a seven doctors, would you appear in it, do you think? Yeah, sure, why not? Mm, I um, would. Why did, why did you decide to leave in 1965? Well, uh, <laughs> my character wasn't developing at all. They wouldn't let me grow up in any way. And the, the four regular characters became, in a way, less exciting to do than the people who came into the show, you know. It became very, very repetitive. We found we were doing exactly, well, certainly I as the character, Susan, was doing very much the same thing in every story. There didn't seem anywhere for her to go unless they allowed her to grow up. And they wouldn't allow her to do that. And I was very bored with it, frankly. And I was being offered some nice things. <laughs> would, you, would you want, um, both, both of you, would you want them to do another anniversary story in the style of the five doctors and the three doctors? Do you think it could ever be done now? It gets more difficult the more doctors you introduce. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. If you've got the writer to do it, um, it's quite possible. I think Seven it would, doctors. Don't you think it would work better, perhaps, not in just a one-off, but if they had, say, a seven or eight-part episode or some mm, uh, yeah. series? Because, I mean... Otherwise, uh, there are too many people trying to take a bit of the cake, and you know, there's just it, it turns into sort of one line for everybody, yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. and it's not satisfactory for anyone. Then, ah, uh, here comes the gentleman who I ah, like a great deal. Oh, I thought you were having a whole no bottle. Germans in the house, so that's the, to be French. Oh, it had oh. to be French. Yes. Oh, well, I don't mind. Both my children are half French, so that's all right. Oh, yes. And God bless you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You do look after me. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Do we have another very question? nice wine, too? Thank you. Another question from anybody. Yes, there's one down here. Gentleman with a beard. I've yes. I haven't got a beard. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's somebody else. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't Can't even worry. see you. Where Don't are worry. you? Stand up. Give me a few minutes and I'll go on. Can Nick tell us if he has signed up at all for the next season? Aha, uh -huh, another rumor. Yes. Yes. A wild uh, rumor, maybe. Yes. Um, rumors, rumors. Yes, I know about rumors. Uh, but I have to tell you, no, I'm not. But, 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 but. I am writing a book at the moment, and it's called Whatever Happened to the Brigadier. Ah. And I think it'll be published. 
even if I had to pay for it. <laughs> this is for the Target series, is it? Um, um, I don't know yet, because I haven't written a thing. I mean, I've got to write it before <laughs> I can even approach anyone and then get advice about which publisher to go to, or and I'm taking advice from a lot of friends of mine. But um, <clears throat> it is whatever happens to bring it in. I've got all the plot line laid out. It's just that the self-discipline of writing is uh, something I, you know, you've got to get down to that desk every day, and you can't just do it. I know I can beat deadlines, because I had to write 2,000 words in one afternoon for an American publication, and I can beat a deadline with writing. Mm -hmm. But I am going to do that book, Come Hell or High Water. And I think I want to make a promise that, I believe there's a Panopticon in September, isn't there, in yes. London? If I haven't finished it by then, then I think people are entitled to be very critical of me. <laughs> Well, you could write it on, write the last final chapter on stage at Panopticon. Or okay. <laughs> we'll get the audience to write it. Yes, and another question. Nick, how would you uh, react to people saying you're the most popular of the Doctor Who companions, if you like? And who would you, who did you, of the Doctors, who did you enjoy most working with? Is this a question for me? Yeah, Nick. Well, uh, the doctor I enjoyed working with most was the doctor I was working with at the time. Oh, diplomacy. <laughs> yes, well, you see, my father was a professional diplomat, so you can see where it comes from, apart from being a military man. Now, I worked with all, uh, I like working with all of them, and as he says in The Five Doctors, splendid chaps, all of them. Um, sorry, what was the first part of your question? Uh, how, how do you react? Well, I don't know that I am the most popular of the companions, because actually I'm only an honorary companion, you yeah. realize that. It's been printed. I'm not a real companion, possibly because I'm not a woman. I don't <laughs> think that's the only reason. No, it can't be. Um, it, he's, he's an honorary companion, isn't he, the Brigadier, because he was very well, reluctant yeah. ever to get in the then TARDIS. Then he put in the TARDIS once, twice. Yeah, and three doctors. Yeah. Um, but it's very sweet of you to say <laughs> the most popular companion, because I don't know that I necessarily am. But thank you for saying it. Um, it's very nice for you, and not modesty forbids anymore. <laughs> Another Somebody question. there. Oh, we've got lots now. Oh. Um, Nick, in mm. Mordrin on Dead, um, we saw that the Brigadier uh, became a schoolmaster. Mm. Do you think that was quite likely, or do you think it, it would have been better that it would have turned out another way? Um, well, all I know is, uh, at Tom Baker's farewell party, John Nathan Turner came up to me and said, you probably don't remember me, uh, but I was floor manager in your days, Doctor Who. And I said, yes, I do remember you. He said, do you want to come back to the program? I said, yes, when? <laughs> he said, well, give me a break. <laughs> and um, then he rang me up in 82 and said, look, this, this is the story, and uh, you want our schoolmaster, etc." Um, there's, I think it's, it's perfectly possible that uh, a man who'd retired from the army would become a schoolmaster. For example, lots of naval gentlemen become bursars in various public schools in England. So that was quite possible. I think the only thing which was quite fun, which I enjoyed with Peter Davison when he looked at me and well, I had that line about teaching mathematics, that is fairly extraordinary and unusual for Nicholas Courtney because when I was at school in Egypt, the headmaster put at the bottom of my report one term, I defy anyone to drive mathematics into Nicholas's head. <laughs> history master, yes, because history has always been my subject and my favorite subject. Um, but that is much more likely. But I think it's quite possible that he uh, might have gone to being a um, schoolmaster. And you will have to wait till the book comes out what happens after he goes back to school. You'll have to wait for that. So it's all planned. The, the book is set after Mordred Undead or in between the intervening the years? The book is set after the Five Doctors. <coughs> after his but where time is the Five Doctors set? What? Where is the Five Doughters set in relation to Mordred Undead? Well, the last line that Pat Troughton had to me in the Five Doctors was, come on, Brigadier, back to school. Mm. You see? Yes. Uh, yes. So the Five Doctors would have followed Mordred Undead, wouldn't it? Well, probably, yes, yes. Don't well, ask it's very, me. But you see, you I met can't in Mordred Undead, the Brigadier meets himself Peter has Davison's a breakdown. <coughs> well, yes, but he also meets Peter Davison's doctor. Yes, um, in two in two different periods of time. That's right. Mm. I can't explain all that. No, I no, just I don't say the lines. Stand a word of it. I, I just say the lines. <laughs> I remember when I read the script. I was with a friend of mine uh, in the south of France on holiday, and this actress, writer, friend of mine, Liz Morgan, who's a lovely actress. Um, I said, Liz, do you understand this? And to this day, you know, I don't understand Mordred Undead. But that's very much in character with the Brigadier. I mean, he couldn't <laughs> understand 
the, all this going on. He just was resigned about all these faces changing and yet another doctor turning up and here we go again and some of the lines which I was allowed to write. Um, he knew the doctor was on the side of the angel, so that was all right. And I think he just accepted it. Another question. Oh, I don't know where to look. Hello, Where's Nicholas. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask you, were you ever approached to play against Colin Baker as the Brigadier? The reason I ask is that I heard a rumour that at the end of Trial of a Time Lord, the character of Sablon Glitz was reintroduced, and I was told that originally it was conceived as the Brigadier. Well, my answer to that is not to my knowledge, but I don't know about that, because actually I saw Tony Silby the other day. Uh, no, but the straight answer is I was not approached to be with Colin at all. I mean, I first met Colin at a convention in Florida uh, when he hadn't even been seen in America, and he was wonderful. He arrived in Miami full of jet lag and just took over and was uh, wonderful at this convention. Um, no, I was never asked to be with Colin, and, you know, Colin didn't have much time to prove himself as a doctor because no. the program was axed. Mm. But, no, I was never asked. Would you like to appear against Sylvester McCoy? Well, of course I would. Obviously I would. But whether I will or not is up to the next producer, I think, because John Nathan Turner will be leaving by the end of this year, this season. Who oh, is he? Yeah. Oh. And um, so I don't know. You know, I don't know. Who's taking over? Well, I've left that. I don't know that either. <laughs> Even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Why? No, I, I, well, all right, I might. But um, no, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, oh, Yes, of course I'd like to. I, I mean, I may have missed the sixth doctor, but I'd love to be with the seventh doctor. And I was, saw Sylvester the day before yesterday. And um, I think we get on very well indeed. Mm. Um, can I ask Carol, did she prefer the historical stories to the science fiction based ones? Where are you? Can you put your hand up? Ah, there you are. Thanks. Oh, yes, I did. Always. Yes. Gave me a chance to dress up. And we all like dressing up, we actors. Did you have a particular favourite one? Yes, the one which we don't have everything left. I think there are a few missing, the French Revolution one. Oh, yeah. Reign of Terror. Yeah. Reign of Terror. Which yeah. my friend Ian Mart, as you know, novelised. Mm. Um, and I've got a copy of it. Um, and uh, you see, I'm like that. I wish I'd been in the history time, because <laughs> I love history, and I'd love to try to play old villains like Robespierre, possibly, or some of them. It was, it was very, very good. I don't know if any of you have managed to see any of those just, episodes. just a few episodes of it. The there. sets yeah. were particularly fantastic. Mm. They were absolutely marvellous. They really were. I mean, this wonderful set of Rouen, and we had real horses. <laughs> it was also the, the first time that Doctor Who ever went on location, I believe, wasn't it, for that story? No. Yeah? No? No. Oh. Didn't well, go on location. <laughs> I never went on location. I went on location, I think, to say goodbye. In the last one, I was sort of sitting in a very muddy, wet patch <laughs> beside the River Thames. That's about the only location I ever did, not to. Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> I'm wrong there, then. I wish. No, you see, the sets were so good. Well, you thought they were yes, on location. Yes. No, yes. They're yeah. always lousy during my time locations. I mean, like the clay pits in Cornwall or mm. the Dungeness. Yeah. Uh, you know, they yes. were all... Uh, after I left the program, they started going to lands. I know, <laughs> I know, I'm so envious. <laughs> you look at them in their lovely bikinis and their tan tans and everything. And I mean, you you see the Doctor Who people now, you know, all the actors playing in Doctor Who, and they they're brimming with health and vitality because all these wonderful locations. <laughs> Even when I do five Doctors, what do I get? I get a blooming gravel pit in Wales or something. I've waited all these years to come back and I still don't go to Lanzarote and wherever they're going to. Oh well. um, can we have the microphone down here? There's lots of people with questions down here, or there were a moment ago. Yes. Perhaps there questions. Yeah, who, right, who answered. had a question down here? There were hundreds of hands a moment ago. This one. Yes. Uh, Nick, uh -huh. did, you ha did you have any advice on how to play uh, the Brigadier, or how to set up the unit scene? sort of thing? Well, um, no, I didn't have any advice. Uh, the whole thing, as I'm sure some of you may have heard before, it's really rather paradoxical, because when I did my national service, which I had to do, I was a private in the army for 18 months. That's why I presume I played brigadiers. No, but my father was um, a professional soldier before he became a diplomat. So maybe it rubbed off, and uh, during my time in the army, I had a chance to observe the officers. Uh, the chinless wonders with huge private incomes who you wouldn't follow into battle anyway if you had any sense. And the good officers, like, who would lead from the front and not ask their men to do anything they wouldn't do themselves. So I guess I just observed them and 
I never quite understood why I keep on playing all these army officers, because I don't want to lead anyone anywhere, certainly not into war, and um, lead them astray, possibly, from time to time. But um, it's, it's quite curious. I play all these authority characters, and I don't think I'm very authoritarian by nature. I mean, Nick is not authoritarian by nature. Give the impression of being it. Very well, I know, but that, tones there you go, too, you that's see, what it is. That, that's, that's, your, that's me playing a part. A celluloid soldier, not a serious soldier. <laughs> Another question. Um, I'd like to ask Carolyn if she still enjoys watching the programme um, as much as she did when she'd done it. Um, <laughs> and my dad comes from Wales. <laughs> I love Wales. I adore Wales. One of my most favourite places. It's just that you should have seen, I mean, Nick knows, yeah. you should have seen the wild and woolly place that we were taken to. I mean, it was freezing, freezing cold. It was really very cold indeed. Rain doesn't often come uh, yes. out on film. And we were all twisting our ankles all over the place because they were, you know, it was, it was, it was not very attractive. And I really love, love Wales, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> And, oh, do I, I, I must confess, I've only seen the very first one of, of the current one. Oh, no, I haven't. I saw, oh, I did see a couple of very strange ones you where... You saw Sylvester, have you seen... Yeah, I, yes. I, saw, I saw one where there were two old ladies who were about to eat up oh, Bonnie yes. Langford. <laughs> well, we were cheering Did they ever on. eat her? Uh, sadly, no. Is that uh, why uh, she's <laughs> not doing it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a ve a very strange, uh, mm. very imaginative. Yes, yes. Very unlike anything we ever did. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there going to be a new Doctor Who now? Is he leaving, Sylvester? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Uh, no we've we've got no intention some. of leaving. No. I'm looking forward to meet meeting the girl who's going. I didn't know there was going to be a new one. I'm yes, looking forward yes. to meeting her. Well, yes, yes we've got uh, we've got. Um, oh, yes. Well, you know that anyway, don't you, folks? We've got Sophie Aldred here, so um, yep. so um, yes, yeah. we'll, we shall have the first companion and the very. Does latest she sing and dance too? Oh, all the time. <laughs> yes, you can't stop. I mean, it's going to be very embarrassing trying to interview her. I mean, <laughs> tap dance routines on, on the table. Clear the table, yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> yes. Another question, I think. Do you believe the unit stories were actually set in the future or in the present day? Uh, I'm sorry. What, what, you know the unit stories? Yeah. Um, can I ask you if you believe they were set in the future or in the present day, although it was contradicted in Margin Undead? Well, absolutely right. Um, I've uh, had this question before, and all I can plead is dramatic license, and I didn't write it anyway. And don't forget, they didn't know. Okay, when the Tale of the Zygons happened, I was very depressed because I thought that's the end of the brig and he'll never come back. And then he was brought back about seven years later. So. The unit stories were supposed to be set in the 80s, weren't they, I think? Yes. Well, you have things like the first manned flight to Mars and so on in some early unit stories. Right. So, so they, yeah. So the whole thing doesn't make sense, because Maud and I was um, between uh, Jubilee, uh, mm. 70, 70 um, when was it? Jubilee, 77, and, um, <coughs> and uh, 80, 83. 83. Mm. So my answer to your question is, I wish I knew the answer. Because I don't, <laughs> but I, but I, I think you know that's sort of, I suppose you have to say dramatic license. But I remember when we were doing the unit stories, they were supposed to be near. So of course it makes it's pretty odd that all those years later, uh, Morton and Dead is set in seventy-seven and eighty-three. Yes. Well, I what think can I do? I would say that it's all in a parallel universe because although so like the Inferno, yeah. although the Pertwee unit stories are supposed to be set in the 1980s, Katie Manning was running around in the most horrendous 1972 wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought it was the miniskirt, wasn't it? No. Well, don't mean she was wearing a wardrobe. No, I mean I mean her, her clothes. <laughs> <laughs> well, another joke like that and I'll be pelted. So can we have a, another question, please? Yes, down at the front here. Karen Ford. Um, I, I think I saw you in the Day of the Triffids a little while ago. Have you done any other acting, film acting, since you left the Doctor Who? Oh, yeah, it's not. <laughs> like what? Actually, I did the Triffids before. I wasn't too sure if it was 65 or before or after. I think. I lose track of what I am doing. <laughs> yes, yes, I've done quite a lot, but um, what I had to do when I left Doctor Who was get right away from television because everybody associated me with the Doctor Who character, and it was very, very difficult to get work. I mean, this is just what happens when you're an actress or an actor in this country, and you get involved in a television Actually, series, which is very, anything very other than that part. <coughs> so either I wasn't being offered television because of Doctor Who, 
or what I was being offered was a totally similar part. And the same with films, funny enough, you know, at that time, not so much now, I don't think, but at that time, people were sort of encapsulated in little boxes and, you know, if you, if you attained any sort of, uh, uh, any great degree of stardom or uh, any people got to know you playing a sort of character, then this is the sort of character that people wanted you to play. So the only way, in fact, I could carry on developing as an actress was just by losing myself in the theatre. And I did, I went off and did a tremendous amount of theatre up and down the country all over the place. And then I did a, a few films. Um, I haven't seen, I did, I did three films. I haven't seen any of them. <laughs> Each one was more dreadful than the other. I did, um, I did one called um, Sarah, which was about Sarah Bernhardt, which was on television recently. I didn't even see it. I wouldn't even be surprised if my bit was totally cut out because it, the whole thing was cut to pieces. Um, I did another one called The Hiding Place which was about Jewish refugees being looked after by the Dutch. Um, oh, gosh, what else did I do? I can't remember. can't remember. Nothing, nothing fantastic. And what, what does the future hold for Caroline Ford? I don't know. I'm, I'm very, very lazy. I'm afraid I've been... I've not been terribly well. I've had all sorts of peculiar things which have stopped me from working. Um, I've now overcome those, and so I could actually start working again. We've also had our house bashed to pieces over the past five years. <laughs> and if anybody's ever been involved in any kind of house building, they'll know it takes the whole of your time. I also had, well, this is not very good, is it, making her a third. I had a delightful daughter who's sitting in the front now. And when I was involved with Doctor Who, I had a daughter then, and I didn't get very much time to see her. And I realized when I had my second one what I'd been missing, and I was determined to spend a lot of time with her. So I, I don't go off on long tours up and down the country, and I don't go off on long locations all over the place. But um, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, I haven't actually been trying to get any work. If it were offered me on a plate and someone said, here is a wonderful part, I would do it. I would love it. I would do it. I would enjoy it. But I haven't been trying to get work. I've been... I've been doing the odd things, you know, nothing that you would have heard about. Uh, taking up a point that Carol made about uh, after Doctor Who, when I left after Tell of the Zygons, I went back again into the theatre and did lots and lots of tours all around the country, and that's very salutary. And then I had a year's contract on the BBC Radio Drama Company, and uh, there's an extremely talented and very favourite director of mine in this hotel at the moment by the name of David Spencer. And... Um, that was a wonderful medium to work in radio. The great thing is being lazy. Uh, uh, Carol said she was lazy. You want to, you want to see me. Um, <laughs> the great thing about radio is you don't have to learn the lines. Now you do have to do your homework, obviously, and it's a wonderful medium, radio, and I think a sometimes undervalued medium. And I love my time on the BBC Rep because um, it was a very good company. And uh, okay, the money wasn't particularly good, but it was all right. Um, and it's a very cosy atmosphere. And the great thing. I think about being an actor or an actress is, it's lovely because if you, you, you should enjoy your job and you get paid for it. I mean, that's a double bonus if you're getting paid for something you enjoy doing. And um, I enjoyed my time on radio very much indeed. It's a great medium. I love radio too. Mm. I really enjoy it. Mm. Just got time for a couple more questions, I'd say. Anyone else? Nick, which story did you enjoy doing the most? Who's this? Uh, uh, who's the question for? We can't uh, see. You, Nick. Oh, me, Nick. Yeah. Okay, me, Nick. Yeah, you, Jane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what story did I enjoy doing? I think I enjoyed Inferno most because I was able to play the two parts. I mean, the brigadier who one hopes you love, and you know, the fascist brigade leader. I mean, it's wonderful to play two completely different sort of parts in one story. And Douglas Campbell directed it wonderfully and um, it's villains are very enjoyable to play and I base that character in Inferno not on uh, the worst person that I ever don't want to hear of again like Adolf I based him on Mussolini because he was a braggart this brigade leader I mean I, I didn't have the physical appearance of Mussolini but he was a braggart and and a bully and coward, you see, and bullies and cowards go together. I mean, people who are bullies are usually cowards anyway. That's what I enjoyed doing most, because it, it really tested me. Um, 
but of course one of the classic stories was always the demons. So it's the demons and Inferno. Personally, Inferno gave me a lot of pleasure to do, because villains are fun to play. Super. Carol, did you have a favourite story? Um, yes, yes I did. Um, it's a very strange one, uh, and I, I enjoyed doing it because it gave me a chance to do something totally different from the normal Susan activities. Mm. And it was The Edge of Destruction. Ah. Yes. You remember that one? Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's the one where you all where go I crazy go a bit in mad. the <laughs> Yes, yes. I think all actors like playing mad people. You it, know? Must have, <laughs> it must have been very strange making that story because it was just written as a fill-in, wasn't it? We it had no idea mm. what we were supposed to be doing. You know, it was really sort of make it up as you go a long time. We all had no idea, yes. Yeah. Even now, I've, I've watched it since, and I haven't... Does anybody here know what was going on? I mean, have, you, have any of you watched it, The Edge of Destruction? Can anyone explain to me what was going on there? No? <laughs> it's surreal. It's faces melting. Like yes, yes, it was wonderful. Yes. Really dolly mm, Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, it was mm, great. Yeah. Mm. So, I think we've probably got time for what... Ah. Sorry, sorry, someone was just talking in my ear. I'm sorry, I think we've got time for one more question, okay? Um, and lo and behold, we're not going to get... And lo and behold, no. we're not going to have one more. There, there were about six hands up last time a question was asked, and only one person got to ask the question, so... Don't, don't be shy, do ask a question, otherwise you will have to listen Anything, to me talking. Anything, be brave. Uh, if, if we let Courtney start rambling on about I what he wants to I think we should start asking about. them questions, actually. Yes, much more yes, fun. start her. Oh, we've got a hand up at the back. Yes, we have. Yes, hello. Can... can Uh, yes, um, you mentioned your radio work, Nick. Um, isn't it? I, I seem to recall you're in a, a serial called Outbreak of Fear. Correct. Just and I also seem to recall that, although it wasn't revealed until the very last episode, you actually played a brigadier in that part. Extraordinary, was it? Do you know, I never heard it when it first went out. I did that when I was on the radio drama company in about 81, and they repeated it, thank God, this year, and I need all the repeat checks I can get. <laughs> and um, I never heard it when it first went out, and I listened to it. And that was quite extraordinary, wasn't it? There's, uh, he was a police officer who turned out to be a brigadier. It's quite extraordinary. As opposed to the part I just played in the West End, I did a year's national service in the Mousetrap recently, and I was playing an army officer who turned out to be a policeman. So, I mean, you know, I mean, what is this going on here? Someone pretends to be a policeman, turns out to be an army officer, and I get all the parts. Not enough, not, not enough parts. I don't mind going playing army army characters um, I just like being employed yes he was he turned out to be a brigadier didn't he uh, what do you think of the um, the piece I don't understand thrillers uh, well, I it, was very it was all right was it I mean oh, I yes, don't mean uh, me I, I mean was hooked the, yes the story yes. It, it was fun to do Brian Miller who's a director of Bristol it was a, a science fiction piece wasn't it yes it was about um, rabies uh, well it was a, a killer virus or something a killer virus that's right yes mm. I thought it was fairly exciting I mm. heard it as I say, only this year. I didn't hear it when it first went out. Was it just a coincidence about the, the Brigadier, or was did the writer deliberately uh, no, pick up? No, it was a coincidence. Mm. It wasn't written for me at all, uh, because I'd been in Doctor Who before that. No, it was, I think it was a coincidence. It really was, and that's presumably why I was cast in the part by the, the director in Bristol. Well, um, through the miracle of um, the earpiece, I'm now informed that we've got time for another question. <laughs> so come yes. on, you guys. We've got, you a, hand, work. We've got a hand work. in the aisle there. Nicholas. Yes. What other character would you play in Doctor Who, apart from the Brigadier? I don't think I'd want to play any other character, actually. Because I've been associated and know this man so well. And you've never seen it on the screen, because it's not called about the Brigadier. It's called Doctor Who. I honestly don't think I will play another part, except the Brigadier. And I don't think I would want to, somehow. I mean, although I, mean, I love playing villains and, and all that, but I really don't think there's any part I'd like to play. I mean, a lot of people say, well, wouldn't it be fun, you know, if the Brigadier became the Doctor? Wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. I wouldn't be a good Doctor. So that's the answer to that question. I don't think I'd like to play another part, would you believe? Yes. It's down, down, down the aisle there. Hello. Um, I was wondering, with the, uh, these conventions, you, went, you, you, you were both in Longleat, um, which was a bit of a 
disaster, really. <laughs> Organised waste. Oh, was it? Well, no, I mean... From what the, point of view? With the, um, the, the amount of people who turned up. I mean, you yourself, I, I remember seeing you getting rather harassed by quite a few fans at one point. You and... Oh, me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we needed an army escort. Yes. Uh, yes. I don't know how many people were, were at Longleat. They were expecting a few thousand. Oh, yes. It was quite frightening. Every, every it, all wrong. Yeah. it was very frightening. Well, 44,000, wasn't it, altogether, over well, two days? The Enterprise has got it wrong again. Mm. Do you know, they had the radio sending out warnings to people, the police and the army, they were all sending out warnings, don't <laughs> attempt to go anywhere near it, because I think there was something like a 15-mile queue yeah. Yeah. trying to get there. Yeah. Do you did, do you have any, uh, uh, did, well, has there been any other conventions that have been similar disasters? I mean, that, that, that type of way. Well, actually, Chicago went a bit wrong. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> Just a bit. Is this the, the 20th anniversary one? Uh, well, 83. No. 83, yeah. Uh, it November was just a convention, yeah. it wasn't any particular... Was it anniversary? Just, no, just it the was first just American the convention, I think it was. That's right, and Norman Rubenstein set it up, and then 13,000 people actually turned up. What was bad about that convention is we were treated very well in yes. Oh, yes. but the fans were treated very badly yes. in mm -hmm. Chicago I thought because they just cut off the lines of autograph queues and you know and fans who paid a lot of bucks to get in to see that um, convention. And I they were very people. patient they were marvelous weren't they? They, they were, were very polite very I mean good. we thought there's going to be mass hysteria yeah. but they were they queued and they queued and they queued and like Longleat some people were queuing about three hours just to get an autograph and then just as it was their turn to yeah. come up, they were told, no, no, go away, go away, they're going now, they're going. And I, I felt so sorry for them. Yeah, very bad. Another yes, feeling. it was very bad. <laughs> Another feeling. You were one of those who didn't get an autograph yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. Long leads. You'll yes, get one today. Leads. You'll get one, yes, you'll get one today, that's for sure. Um, a lot of people have actually said there's a, um, a lot of uh, people who've been to conventions in America have said there's a big difference between the American fans and us lot. Mm. Do, you, do you think there is? Yes. What is it? Uh, you you go get, first. Oh, <laughs> well, okay, I, I'll tell you, uh, because I, in 85 and 86, I did a heck of a lot of conventions in the States because there was no work over here for me. Basically, the difference is that they're American and we're <laughs> British. I mean, it's Brilliant. as simple as that, actually, well, and um, an ocean <laughs> apart is the answer. They're very enthusiastic, <laughs> very generous, very direct, and ask you amazing direct questions which take very personal <laughs> sometimes very personal. <laughs> uh, but um and the british are like the brigadier a bit more laid back and a bit more polite and a bit more hesitant about asking questions but yeah. um i've had enormous generosity and hospitality in america but it's as simple as that they're american and we're british and i had an american grandmother but you know I'm, that's all right not much more I can say, really, yes. <laughs> Absolutely all that. But um, there's something about an American audience which produces a tremendous amount of energy. You feel that at any moment they're all going to, as one, leap upon you and gobble you up. You know, it's, it's a most extraordinary, but in the nicest possible way. You know, <laughs> I mean, they're full of affection. Yes. Um, in some ways, I'm not being at all derogatory or insulting, I hope, but... You know, they're, they're very childlike. You know, they're very upfront about what they feel. I mean, if they think that what you just said was rubbish, they tell you it was rubbish. And if they think that, you know, what you did just then was very interesting and uh, great and marvelous, they'll tell you. They'll stand up and cheer and say all that sort of thing. So much energy. Must be what they eat. <laughs> or perhaps it's the sun. I don't know. But yes, that, that they feeling. Eat. They eat. But everything that they do is done um, sort of 500 times bigger than we do it here. They're tremendously enthusiastic mm. and, uh, and it overwhelms you. I'll never forget Chicago and on that last ceremony, closing ceremonies. I mean, this sea, I mean... I oh, it was. It, it was, was. it was wonderful. Yes, we were in it tears. It was <laughs> absolutely overwhelming. It was, yes, it, it was yes. terrific. It gave you a feeling of being a pop star, you know, at a Wembley That's right. thing, you know. But also they treat you as if they've known you for years, which is very nice. I mean, they, they really are all embracing. They'll sort of come up, total stranger will come up and cuddle you and and tell you their life story too I mean they'll want to know yours but they're also they're quite willing to immediately open up and tell you everything about yes, themselves that's very American yes, yes. it's yes. lovely <laughs> right now just 
because there's been a, there's a sudden proliferate, proliferation <laughs> of uh, <coughs> proliferation of, of hands up over there, we will have the absolutely final question. They've heard that before. No, this really, this is the, this is it. <laughs> this is the big one. Someone, someone down there. There's been quite a few hands up down there. I knew someone oh. was going to ask that. Right. The, You're the so crunch. totally, totally yeah. different. I mean, oh, in it's it's very, very enjoyable to do both types of convention. It really is. All I can say is I go away from the American conventions having enjoyed myself tremendously but being absolutely exhausted. I mean, I take three days to recover from one of those, I would say. Really, it is very exhausting, very, very exhausting. And while I enjoy the British ones as much, I can go off and do whatever ever I have to do the next day quite happily. <laughs> and I, you feel I, same? I, I didn't my answer to that is um, I tried to live in America for a bit uh, in work in Los Angeles and I decided very quickly that I couldn't live in America because I don't actually they're not my favorite values in America because it's too ultra materialistic for my liking and I, I wouldn't mind working there because they pay you an awful lot of money but I don't want to live there I decided that very quickly um, because it's I mean the Hollywood's tinsel town it really mm. is and it's Phony baloney, and I don't like phony baloney. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> well, I said it because I believe yeah, it, because um, yeah. I tried. And uh, so, does that sort of answer your question? I mean, I, when I was out of work, I had to <coughs> come back here. I'd rather be out of work in England than I would in America, because believe me, the dollar sign around the neck is <laughs> that's America. <coughs> Super. Well, <clears throat> on that intercontinental note, just for now, they will be seeing them again later on today and tomorrow. Can you say thank you and goodbye to Nicholas Courtney <laughs> and Caroline Ford. Now, I've got to make an announcement. If you'd like to um, go on down, I'll join you in a second. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.